DJ's on the verge. Good evening, I'm Stone Malone, and if you're a fan of the blues and incredible guitar work, then you picked a very good night to tune in. My guest tonight is, without question, one of the best guitarists in the country. His first instrument was a ukulele, uh, but fortunately he picked up the guitar about a year later. And not, not that there's anything wrong with the ukulele. He's one of the best when it comes to blues guitar. This is David Gogo, and yes, that is his real name. The new album is Halfway to Memphis, On the Verge, Calgary's Best Rock, CJ92. Calgary's Best Rock, CJ92, that's Louisiana Blues uh, from David Gogo, uh, an old classic. Beautiful song, yeah. Uh, Muddy Waters is the guy I'm first aware of that who did that. Okay. And, uh, uh, we just wanted to have something really killer to open up the album with, and uh, I kind of based that on an old uh, Savoy Brown version of the tune, or as the British would say, Savoy Brown. <laughs> okay. But it's uh, it's really fun. I had to really tune the ukulele up tight for that one. Ah, <laughs> So Morgan, uh, McKinley, I'm sorry, McKinley Morganfield? That's actually Muddy Waters' uh, real name. It is? Yeah, for what? some strange reason on the album, the record company credited one song to McKinley Mor Morganfield and one to Muddy Waters, but that's his real name. Very interesting. Kooky, huh? Right? Yeah, that's different. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing great. That's... I'm just uh, just thrilled to be uh, back in this part of the world rocking and rolling. It's just the audiences have just been super and uh, been exciting. Uh, the voice you're hearing, of course, is Mr. Uh, David Gogo, and uh, the new CD, as I mentioned earlier, is called Halfway to Memphis. Any special meaning behind that title? Well, I was going to call it Halfway to Car Stairs, <laughs> but it didn't quite have the same ring that, to it. That was taken anyway, I think. Somebody else got it. <laughs> but, um, well, you know, there's so many songs about Memphis. It's kind of this mystical place in, in, in music uh, lore, I guess, and I felt it was my time to write a song about the city, but it was actually a song that woke me up. And as a songwriter, quite often when you're drifting off into sleep, you kind of get these, you know, tunes happening, and you think, oh, I'll wake up and I'll remember that, and you never do. Right. And, uh, in fact, one time, a guy told me you should keep a tape recorder by the bag, you know, so I tried that, and I just got up in the mornings all excited to hear my song, and I press the tape, and it's kind of this... <laughs> <laughs> so at this time I actually got up, put on a pot of coffee, and the song basically wrote itself, you know, and by the time it was done about six in the morning, I phoned a buddy of mine as a songwriter down in Nashville and played it for him, and he gave it the approval just in the acoustic guitar over the telephone, so. Oh, cool. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and then with the completion of this record, uh, you have said that you're feeling probably a certain sense of satisfaction, like you've... Uh uh, the final chapter in, in kind of a musical journey. Yeah, it's a funny thing. You know, the album was initially recorded with the intention of only releasing it in Europe because uh, I have a European record label over there called Dixie Frog that specializes in blues, and they've only released one album of mine, uh, Dying Under the Stars, which was a live electric blues album, and uh, they wanted to follow up. So I thought, well, we'll go back to the same place where we recorded the live album and um, just set up the boys and kind of do it live off the floor, but take advantage of the studio for certain overdubs and, you know, making a more song-oriented thing than kind of a jam-oriented album. And we put it out over in Europe, and it sold double of what I um, sold previously in the first two months. Really? Which is to say well under a million copies. But, <laughs> <laughs> but still a great response. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I went over to do a tour there, and uh, I have a, a band in Holland that I play with, and they were all excited about doing this new album, and I hadn't really given it you know, much thought. And then all of a sudden I listened to it, and I went, you know, this is pretty good. So we put it out in Canada, and it's the first album that I don't get kind of embarrassed when people play it. Like, it's always weird when you go to people's house for dinner, and they put on your album. It's the last thing I want to hear. But, you know, I really think it stands up again against um, my peers very well. It's the first one that I'm real confident. Like, I could hand it over to Eric Clapton and say, hey, you know, like, this is what I do. And that's recorded in your in your backyard? Well, kind of, yeah. yeah. I live in, on the outskirts of Nanaimo, B.C., and there's uh, the Queen's Hotel is a live venue we quite often play there. And in their basement, they have a little studio. Well, it's actually getting to be quite a big studio now. They've expanded. And uh, working with fellas I've known since I was about 14 years old. And it just seems whenever I do a project that's kind of a no-brainer to me, and it's just something easy, and, you know, the pressure's off, it seems to be my best work. And in a lot of ways, I, I think, you know, some people are thinking, well, geez, why didn't you just make this record 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. But that being said, I don't think I could have done it without the experience that I've gone through in the last decade of my career so and you've also said it's an album where you uh, where you address the influences of your friends and legends too uh, yeah yeah um um you know, I've kind of uh, flirted with rock and roll and acoustic music and stuff throughout my career, but blues, especially electric blues, is always my first love, and uh, recently built a home up on the family, the Gogo -Go family compound, and uh, in the process of moving, and my dad saying, take all your crap home, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to get all my vinyl back, and you know, when I was a youngster, I was really excited about blues, and I bought a lot of stuff, so I kind of rediscovered my uh, vinyl collection, and uh, and really got re-inspired um, by the music that inspired me in the first place. That's always a cool thing when that happens, isn't it? It really I is, you know. Once you get beyond the McLean and McLean records. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And so, as I mentioned earlier, ukulele was your first 
Not, probably not your choice. Uh, was given to you by your parents? Well, the, yeah. I mean, I cannot remember a time in my life where I didn't either have a toy guitar or really want a guitar. And it's a funny thing, and I'll, I'll never forget... Um, I was over in the mainland visiting some relatives, and, and one of them had a music store, so I really wanted a guitar, and I, I was sitting on a chair, and they put the guitar on my lap, and I couldn't see over the guitar body. That's how little I was at the time. So they just got a ukulele, because at least you know I could hold it comfortably. And I think it was probably a year or so later that I got a guitar, just because I physically wasn't big enough to, to hold a guitar. <laughs> okay. And you still play a ukulele a little bit now? Actually, I, yeah. I have a two-year-old son, and he's, he's got one now. I picked oh, one up. Okay. He's got a little gig bag, too, so he likes that. But unfortunately, the other day, he was in the back room, in the music room, whacking on the drums, and a buddy of mine says, look at that, he might be a drummer. And I said, oh, man, I was hoping he'd be a musician. That's not good news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking with uh, David Gogo. My name is Stone Malone. He's in studio tonight with us. Let's go back to the CD at this point. Uh, it's called Halfway to Memphis. So we're going to hear one of the four original David Gogo tracks on the album. This one is called Bad Faces. Uh, David, any history to this track before we roll it out? Yeah, there is, but I can't really discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? No, it's a funny term that uh, I heard uh, someone say, like I was, I was mentioning before, I was in Holland. I've been playing in Europe quite a bit, and it's impressive because everyone there speaks English, but this woman was trying to describe to me, uh, she was hanging out with the band after hours, and she said, I better leave. She says, otherwise, when I go to work tomorrow, she said, this is a pretty small town, and they'll be giving me those bad faces. <laughs> so I kind of, I wrote it down, man. I wrote it down right then and there, and I told oh, really? her, I said, I'm going to use that, so hopefully she'll hear it. All right, let's have a Listen to it. It's called Bad Faces from David Gogo on Verge, Calgary's best rock, CJ92. Calgary's best rock, CJ92. That's David Gogo on Verge. The song is called Bad Faces. Uh, the new CD is called Halfway to Memphis. Time for a break. When we come back, we'll talk about Stevie Ray Vaughan. We'll talk about production and what's ahead. For David Gogo. Stay tuned for more from CJ's On The Verge. Brought to you by itscanadian.com. Your entertainment source without the syrup. Calgary's best rock, CJ92. That's David Gogo. Uh, doing an old Muddy Waters track, actually, called, uh, I believe, calling called uh, Roland and Tumblin. Mm -hmm. uh, reason for that choice? That was actually based off uh, an Elmore James version of that song um, that was just kooky because it just kind of stays it's almost like mantra-esque it kind of stays just on one chord the whole time and i really dug the elmore version so we decided to kind of rock it up a tiny bit and uh i'm actually playing a lap steel guitar on that track which is just a small little thing that you play on your lap right. with a piece of steel <laughs> 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 and uh I, I it's just kind of cool and we tried to get the funky vibe and the vocals there too of the old recordings when the guys would be singing so hard in those old tube mics that we just kind of max out and you get like a distortion on the voice so yeah it's just a it's just a funny funny beat you know if i don't know if it's Samba or Bossa Nova, but it's just a strange mix of, I guess these guys would just come up with these grooves and these old blues clubs trying to get people to dance and, you know, to something other than just a regular 12-bar shuffle. That's the voice of David Gogo. I'm, I'm still alone in studio tonight with Mr. Gogo. Uh, the CD produced uh, by yourself. The, well, you know, I'll tell you the truth, I, I didn't even want there to be a producer's credit on the album. In fact, right. the artwork I was given, and I approved, there was no producer. I put it as a gorgeous gingham production, which was just a little name that I... Um, copyrighted for a proprietorship because when I had my first record deal with France, they needed an actual label to put on the contract. So I just came up Gorgeous Gingham. It's a, a term of a Captain Beefheart song. And I kind of wanted that to be like a pseudonym of my own self-productions because I feel with this music, you know, like, you know, George Martin is a producer, you know? And, yeah, but, but with the Blues right. album, what's really going on? So it was supposed to be, just be recorded and engineered by Rick Salt, who did a great job of getting those sounds on the tape. I basically oversaw the project, obviously. I picked yeah. out the songs, came up with most of the arrangements. But I think it's kind of pretentious. You know, I hate seeing albums with, produced by David Gogo, written by David Gogo, you know, overseen by David Gogo. <laughs> Although I did, I, did, I did take the photographs. You did take these photographs. Except for the ones of me. Right, of course. But it's kind of fun. So it was a real hands-on project, the whole thing for me. And that makes it even feel better, you know, like like we're getting just great reviews. Even in, in like, alternative press and, and magazines that, quite frankly, I'd often be scared to be reviewed in, <laughs> you know. So it, it really does give a real sense of satisfaction because, I mean, right from... Uh, Soup to nuts, man. I was, I was you know, on the project, so it was great. Now, here's a question you've probably been asked a thousand times, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to ask it once more. Um, and this is, a, this is your idol, one mm -hmm. of your idols, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Tell me about the first meeting you had with him. Well, the very first time I met him actually was just at a little record uh, signing. Uh, believe it or not, he was opening up for Men at Work. In Vancouver. Work. Isn't that strange? I saw strange? those guys a couple years ago. Yeah, I was in yeah. grade eight, and I, my uncle took me over, and uh, it ends up he's doing an autograph signing. So I met him very briefly, and when I got back, I was just blown away by Steve's performance, and I like left 
after because it was just a religious experience. And the next day at school, everyone's, how was men at work? And I was like, I didn't <laughs> stay. But I did get to meet him the next time. He's in Victoria, and I just happened to be walking down the road. At this time, he just was everything I wanted to be because I was a weirdo when I was 14. I listened to B.B. King records and Albert Collins and all these guys. And quite frankly, I didn't want to like Stevie Ray Vaughan when I first heard about him because to me, he was a new guy. And how could a new guy be any good? Yeah. But then I heard him, and I mean, it was really, really rare, man, in the early 80s to find a guy doing that and, 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 and someone relatively young that was coming up with new things that I could, you know, kind of be an idol. So when I was walking down the road in Victoria, I had a hat like his. And a, and a shirt I'd got at the other concert and his manager just happened to be walking the street and started talking to me and I went up to the, the venue and I can hear him doing sound check and the promoter came out and said well I'll go see if I can get you an autograph the manager comes out and he says oh is that that kid with the hat and actually brought me backstage and met the guys and Stevie was just the coolest guy in the whole world like they're doing sound check he just put the guitar right on me and let me play through his, his amps and everything and uh, kind of saw him every time he'd come up to the coast and he'd you know I'd somehow finagle my way backstage he'd always remember me and in fact the last time I saw him was a few weeks before he died and it was a really special time because I'd just been touring with Albert Collins and I was on the verge of getting signed to a major label and uh he told me that he was really proud and he was really glad that i you know that i'd realized that uh hero worshiping you know is, is that we're all just people you know right. and, and these yeah. guys are just people in fact there's a book on him called soul to soul where they actually mentioned that incident in victoria where i guess where stevie was the first time that he realized that he was on the other side of that whole hero worship thing the way he worshiped people like hendrix and and who and albert king and whoever and yeah. so he was just is really you know it's an honor for me if a lot of people go like they try to avoid being compared to artists that they're obviously similar to but to me it's an honor and in fact i'm going to be opening a couple dates for uh double trouble Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout the, the, the summer. The backing band, obviously, for uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. This summer. They we're just putting it to, yeah, just, it's, it's happening right, like, really quick. Okay. Well, here, we'll get more details. Yeah. Now. Check Very, out my website. Ah, there it is. Plug <laughs> that right now. www.davidgogo.org. O-R-G? Yeah, because okay. I'm a non-profit organization. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Check that out. I'm chatting with uh, David Gogo tonight uh, in studio. And let's go back to the CD, why, why don't we? Uh, this one's called Soul Fever, and it's on The Verge. Calgary's Best Rock, CJ92. Calgary's Best Rock, CJ92. That's David Gogo. The new CD is called Halfway to Memphis. And he's in studio tonight with me. Uh... David, what's next? Touring uh, this summer? Yeah, just going crazy this summer, which I'm just loving. Um, I did a lot of acoustic work over the winter, which I enjoy, but uh, it's definitely ready to rock. It's time to rock. So um, I'll be uh, doing a blues festival on Mount Tremblant Blues Festival in Quebec coming up shortly. And um, then I'm back out west for a couple of shows and back out to um, Ontario again. I'm just kind of like flying back and forth all the time. And... Um, it's nice this year, you know, like like we, we got the, the chance to open up some big th uh, theater dates for Buddy Guy, as well as just playing the regular clubs we play. So I'm learning to work on all sorts of different stages. You know, it's a big difference between playing to a club audience that's really close to you and playing those theater audiences and tr translating that the, the power or whatever you try to put across. Some bands can't do it. Yeah. You know, some bands are great at it. So I've been learning how to do that. And which would you prefer? Uh, well, I, I, like, I like what's been happening this summer. Is we'll go ahead yeah. of town and play like a little, little club for three nights, just packed and sweaty and everything. Yeah. But I'll say it's pretty nice to get up in those soft cedars where people are there specifically <laughs> just to hear the music, you right. know. And they, like I say to the boys, it's nice to be a rock star every once in a while. <laughs> True enough. All right, and check out the CD. Again, it's called uh, Halfway to Memphis. David, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, take care. Stay tuned for more.